Well, good morning. And on behalf of the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all uh, this morning for a conversation with Arash Azizi. Um, thank you, Arash, for being with us this morning. Um, we have a, a very interesting book, a very interesting set of uh, topics related to Iran to discuss. Um, we're going to be talking about the shadow commander, Soleimani, the U.S., and Iran's global ambitions. And this is going to be an on-the-record event. Of course, we will save plenty of time for audience participation and Q&A. So um, while Mr. Azizi is giving his opening comments about the book, please feel free to start submitting questions by the Q&A. Um, you can also ask your question uh, by raising your digital hand. Um, and when we're ready to do that, Dan Mahaffey will field questions from the audience. Um, it's our pleasure to have you, uh, Arash. The uh, center has been focused this year on a number of national security related issues, many of them fitting under a, a frame of great powers competition. Um, but we always find that uh, whenever we think in, as, you know, in the American national security community that we can decide where we want to spend our efforts and attentions, um, Iran somehow finds its way into the conversation, whether we like it or not, and, and is an important player for us to understand the motivations, the capabilities, the intents um, are something that impact America's national security um, quite significantly. So we're pleased to, to have this um, conversation with you. This is the last um, author conversation we're going to hold uh, for this year. So pleased to end on a really important topic. I want to thank um, Joshua Huminski from our team um, for teeing this discussion up for us today and for his excellent review of the book. Um, he, this has been part of a series that he has helped us uh, grow and has done some really great um, book reviews. So I recommend taking a look at both Joshua's review and The Shadow Commander. Um, the, the issues is vitally important. I spent um, most of 2007 in Baghdad um, as a civilian, but working together with coalition forces. And anybody who spent any time um, with coalition forces in Iraq has been uh, on the receiving end of, um, of Suleimani's attempts to damage American interests. Um, of course, we're not the only ones, but the understanding of his mode of operation um, and the way that he fits into uh, the Iranian way of doing business is obviously important for us to understand. There is a consensus in the United States that preventing Iran from developing nuclear weapons is important. How exactly we accomplish that, there's a vigorous debate about, um, but we all agree on the end goal about the challenges that Iran poses. Uh, so it's very important for us to understand how Iran thinks and operates. So with that, um, let me just say that your book's important. And we appreciate you spending the time with us uh, this morning. And let me go ahead and um, offer you the floor to tell us about the book. Tell us about your process um, and what you think we should take away. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Um, and uh, I followed the work of your center for a long time. So it's definitely a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'll say that um, there are very different uh, ways one could approach this topic. I'll say some of the uh, main things that I think um, might be of interest um, to, um, to some of, of your viewers about what I think can be the best takeaway from the book. Sorry, can you hear me well? It's beautiful. Um, you know, as a, as a historian, I would say one of the things that is frustrating when you follow political debates um, and sort of national security debates in general is what you can call a general sense of historical amnesia. I people um, on, on both sides of the political spectrum, but on all sides of the political spectrum, um, seem to have an understanding that is usually, you know, often based on the political debates that are very intense and sometimes are in the modern days, they're like a couple of weeks old, really. And people seem to have forgotten. Um, now I'm getting of the age that I have myself. <laughs> so come on, I'm 32 now. So I, you know, even without history, one remembers how things were different a few years ago. Um, but beyond that, people seem to often miss the history. So I think uh, no matter, um, you know, which part of this history one has a particular interest in, I hope the history that I offered in this book um, will, will sort of combat that amnesia. So I'll, I'll, I'll say a couple of points that I think are important 
uh, takeaways. I think uh, the reason that a lot of us who study Iran, you know, have jobs, <laughs> you know, and uh, are invited to meetings like this is that Iran is a particularly complex country, Iran of 2020, that can prove, um, uh, that can prove um, sort of really confusing. Um, I'll start with saying, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger has a famous sort of saying from Iran a few years ago that he, that he said, oh, Iran should learn how to be a country, not a regime, uh, uh, not a revolution. So it should be a country, not a revolution. And I think the confusion around Iran is that it's often seen, it's often uh, seen as one or the other, basically. It's some of the defenders of, of the theory that, oh, Iran is just a normal country. We should treat it like any normal country which has its own interest. Um, we'll go to any length to um, hide the ob obvious facts that, well, if Iran is a normal country, how come it does all the things that it does? How come it has someone like Soleimani going around the world and running in those abroad operations? But at the same time, if it was just a revolution, how come, um, you know, how come it does act very much? Um, after all, Iran does not act like a, you know, Islamist ideological group. It often acts like, like a nationalist state, in fact. So I think the key is to accepting that um, Iran is both. Um, no, I don't hide the fact that, you know, I'm an, as an Iranian myself, a conservative Iranian progressive, I, um, I hope, I think many Iranians hope that one day their country will in fact, you know, be just a country, if you will, and, 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 and give, uh, give up, uh, uh, you know, give up the sort of ideological work that this regime does. Um, um, a, um, and I think, and I think that that aspiration is is high, uh, is, is very uh, sort of prevalent in Iran. But at any rate, talking about the realities of the country um, today, you know, we have to realize that it's both. So some of the general takeaways from the book. Um, I'd say that I'd say I'd, I point out to two that might be of interest. One is that. Is anti-Americanism in the DNA of the Islamic Republic and it's sort of a non-negotiable part of it? I think the answer in the book is, is actually a no to this question, although a no in a, in a complicated way. And that complication is that if you look at the history of the Islamic Republic, um, it, it has always had a pragmatic side, a a important part of its sort of leadership had, had always had a pragmatic thought. But beyond that, um, its brand of Islamism is actually not, uh, not necessarily opposed to dealing or having relations with the United States. This is not just theoretical. As I show in the book, Soleimani, uh, years before he uh, sort of fought with the, with the, with the United States, um, effectively collaborated and closely rather collaborated um, in the fight against Taliban with, with the United States and, and later on in Iraq. Although you mentioned being in Iraq in 2007, and I think one part of the, um, one part of the story that many people don't understand uh, is that many uh, people in the United States defense and military establishment were indeed uh, victims of Soleimani's attacks in those years. And that has left a mark, in my opinion, on, on a large section uh, of sort of American military um, um, uh, sort of establishment um, on, on all levels. And I think that's important to understand that for them, Soleimani was someone who had basically killed and wounded um, many people they knew, uh, frankly. And I think this is sort of, sort of forgotten in, in discussions about that. Um, so, so yeah, I think I try to show that this anti-Americanism um, is, is not in the DNA, even though it's very often utilized, even though it's uh, used in the past 40 years, it has been a constant uh, in Tehran. At the same time, uh, it sort of doesn't need to be. I either, as I said, there have always been factions that have been for having different sorts of uh, relations with the West. Um, and uh, Soleimani himself, as, as a someone who was really carrying out the orders of the Supreme Leader, um, uh, you know, he didn't set the policy of the United States, but when, when he was told to do, go a certain way, he would. The other thing that I try to explain is that the internationalism of the, of the Iranian regime, which makes it, to go, to go back to that thing, which makes it, um, you know, a revolution and not just a country. And by internationalism, I, you know, I basically mean doing things abroad, right? Um, and, and this has, this has changed uh, dramatically throughout the four years, as I tried to show in the book. 
the, in the beginning of the revolution, um, like all revolutions, right? You make a revolution usually because you want to change the world. You don't want to just change the government of your country. Grand revolutions has always ha have always had these dreams for the world in, in France, in Russia, in China, often with devastating consequences, of course. Um, same, same with Iran at the beginning, um, there were hopes. That's why Iran wanted to give support to the Irish Republican Army. It wanted to give support to the Black Panther Party. It wanted to, you know, it wanted to support um, the, um, uh, you know, different sort of European even secessionist groups. It, it, it definitely, the idea came up. Um, but what has happened throughout the 40 years is that the, if you will, the sort of uh, sunny internationalism of the early years was very quickly morphed into something that you know something more sinister frankly um that uh that it was it was an islamism that was much more narrow um and that throughout the last 10 15 years under soleimani it became uh it became a form of sectarianism right uh, it, it became um a sectarianism that is again that at the beginning needs to be understood as um as inherently political by which I mean uh, Khamenei and the leadership of Iran very cynically use Shia sectarianism and sort of Shia anti-Sunni playing this main divide inside Islam in order to uh, advance their cause um, of promoting their, their brand of um, revolutionary Islam. Um, and in that sense, um, in that sense, the sectarianism is also not inherent, um, but it's something that, you know, it has a logic of its own. And now, unfortunately, now it's the, uh, language of the region. Now, I actually think the sectarianism will be sidelined um, because in the two main countries uh, where Iranian forces have, have been active, i.e. Iraq and Lebanon, you have an important pushback. Before Soleimani was assassinated, already people of Iraq and Lebanon came out in large numbers against Iranian intervention. And frankly, for sovereignty of their own countries, Lebanon and Iraq, in ways that, uh, in ways that it, it's anti-sectarian. And that's why they use um, they use an anti-sectarian language, um, and that's why they oppose uh, the Iranian intervention. And that's why someone like Prime Minister Qasemi of Iraq uh, has spent much of his uh, energy trying to, uh, well, trying to defang, if you will, the pro-Iran militias that were led by Soleimani, i.e. the Hashid Shabi or the Popular Mobilization Front, um, but also by establishing equal relations of his country with Europe, with, uh, with the United States, obviously, but also with Saudi Arabia, with Iraq, uh, sorry, with, with Egypt, with Jordan, um, and other countries in the region. Um, he's, you know, and I think he is not very well understood in the West sometimes, or, you know, he's been lost in the crazy news of the 2020, but I think he's someone that is very interesting as the first prime minister of Iraq in, um, since 2003 invasion, really, who, who seems to, you know, who seems to very, uh, seems to very much have a, a serious plan for establishing sovereignty of his country um, and, and charting a democratic progressive future for it. And I think, um, you know, I hope I'm not too hopeful for Mr. Kazemi, but I think, but I think it's there. So, um, yeah, so to wrap up, I think um, I'm, I'm hoping that the book is of interest to those who want to understand um, a few things. First of all, how is it that people from the margins like Soleimani, a young boy from the tribal margin of the southern Iran, could come to build this Islamic Republic? What was the experiences, um, uh, you know, that, that, that led to their formation? Like how, how did the regime build them and how did, how did they build the regime? Uh, importantly, the 1980, uh, the 1980 to 1988 war with Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Um, and how Iran has come to um, develop its sort of sophisticated operations abroad. What are we you know? What are the sources of it? Why does it do it? And how it has come to do it in this way? Um, and as it relates to the United States, um, you know, to explain a little bit, the confrontation of Iran and the United States um, in the region um, and around the world, and. Um, how it has not always been confrontation, as I as I try to say, as as demonstrated in the close collaboration in, in against Taliban in the years two thousand and one, um, as attested to by by both Iranian American numerous Iranian American sources that I talk about in this book, you know, like Ryan Crocker, uh, ambassador of the United States then um, to Afghanistan, um, and I hope that it will, you know, I hope that it would be interesting 
for those who want to know this history, but also for those who are interested in policies uh, of the future, that um, um, as the United States will enters a, a new era, era, really, in Middle Eastern policy, um, as it has a very, Biden administration is going to have a very challenging, uh, really, file in relation to Iran and his, his sort of um, program of wanting to return to the Iran year and all the complications that will come. I hope that uh, policymakers can also have this uh, this history in mind, and that you know that can that, that can help illuminate um, some of the decision making. Also, you know, when when you, there's a lot of truisms that I hope re reading books about history and looking at this history um, can complicate and can show that a lot of assumptions that we might have. have uh, Will, you know, they might seem really true in the if you only look at the last two, three years, but if you have a broader historical perspective, uh, that won't be the case. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and I hope we can have a conversation with others. We, uh, again, let me, I, I see that there are uh, several questions already being put into the Q&A box, but I just want to encourage attendees at this point, please um, either submit your questions in writing um, on the Q&A box, or you can raise your digital hand and uh, and Dan Mahaffey will call on you to ask it live. Let, let me start just by asking a question I have. Um, I'm, I'm curious for your thoughts on <clears throat> the goal of Iranian policy to the US, you know, removing some of the obvious constraints currently. What, what would be the end goal in relationship that Iran, Iran's leadership would like to see? And I guess an important element of that is, is there a an option in their minds for a non-nuclear armed Iran to be a player on the world stage. Well, what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I think Ayatollah Khamenei, the leader of the Islamic Republic, who was one of the, its founding members really as a revolutionary in 1979, he's in his 80s and the IRGC, the groups that Soleimani was an important leader of, like the Revolutionary Guard Scopes that we were speaking, um, they have a plan and they have a vision of USA and the West that is not necessarily the same as those of the Iranian people, but also those of the rest of the Iranian establishment. Um, so I'll, I'll say this. I think for the IRGC and Khamenei, they are sort of shrewd players um, who want to deal with the United States. Um, um, they, want to, they want to be recognized by the United States, frankly, right? Uh, like a lot of other... Um, revolutionary leaders did. If you if you think of you know Mao Zedong's China, uh, for example, um, or um, or many today actually many other well they're not revolutionary but they're sort of fundamentally different, um, like the Arab Gulf countries, um, they like the countries of the GCC. Um, so uh, the the con the Arab countries are the Persian Gulf, I should say, as a, <laughs> as a good Iranian. So uh, uh, you know they they have differences, but they want to be recognized. I think Khamenei and, and IRGC would would also want some sort of recognition, but they the crisis of their regime um, is is really endemic and um, won't go away, frankly, because this is a regime of failure inside the borders of Iran already. Is a regime that promised to Islamicize Iranian society, but faces but has to put. Uh, you know, has to kill journalists, suppress dissidents, um, has to put a 18 year old girl who was an Instagram star who, uh, to, she, he, she was sentenced to 10 years uh, in jail just, just a few days ago. Why do I bring this together? Because I think it's, it relates, this reality of the Iran regime is, is, you know, shouldn't be forgotten. So this is a regime that there is a reason you have to be really fragile and vulnerable to put an 18 year old, uh, you know, Instagram star in jail for 10 years, right? Um, and she did really, she did nothing. She, you know, she wanted to look like Angela Julie. Um, uh, Sahar Tabar is her name. But so this, how does this fragility apply to foreign policy? I think they try to, um, they try to promote some sort of anti-Americanism. They try to disrupt any Arab-Israeli sort of peace process, and they they try to promote their vision. But it's it's ultimately been failure. It's ultimately been failure, um, and and this um, this um, strengthens those part of the other parts of the Iranian establishment um, that are more in favor of Iran being a country. Effectively, people like President Rouhani. Um, look, people like President Rouhani know basically that the whole uh, Islamist revolution and all the you know all the talk about it 
uh, has not really led anywhere and has not really uh, favored Iran. And they, again, I make a comparison here with Deng Xiaoping in China and following Mao Zedong. They know that all the talk about the revolution is good, but really, but in no ways are the Democrats, right? I'm not saying these are people who want democracy, but they also know that the whole question of Islamist economy, Islamist this, Islamist that, promoting revolution, they're not into it, basically. They want Iran to be a normal country. So, um, so I think to, to wrap up, I think Khamenei and them want to have a revolutionary project that yes, it's anti-American, yes, it promotes Iran as a strong Islamist power, but there, there is a fundamental failure to this project. And Khamenei well, will die soon, is in his 80s. And whoever comes have to deal with his legacy and how it can uh, work in the future. Um, but that most importantly, any dealing that when Iran deals more with the West and with the United States, it has strengthens those other people, like President Rouhani, like other, um, like other segments of the Iran establishment, who want to who want to have more relations with the West, and frankly, who want Iran to be a more normal country in this sense. And they have important backing in Iranian society, because you know the Iranian people, by and large, are not into the revolutionary project of Khamenei, and and it's very rare for any people, frankly, to be into a revolutionary project for more than a couple of decades. Um, you know, same in Cuba, it was same in China and Soviet Union after many years, and it's same in Iran. Let me turn it over now to Dan Mahaffey, who's gonna feel we have several questions from the audience. So Dan, go ahead, thanks. Uh, thank you, Glenn. And yes, we have some uh, excellent questions here and some, uh, you know, uh, driven by some of the current events, uh, you know, the Biden administration, uh, one I have uh, that I'll start off with is just any uh, thoughts or response that you have to what we've seen with the the kidnapping and the execution of the journalist uh, Rola Zam, and what we can interpret or see from that, uh, you know, barbaric circumstance. Um, it's um, you know it's difficult to talk about it. I, you know, I knew Rola Zam. Um, it's an absolute barbaric act. Let's let's not forget what happened here. The, he was a refugee in France. They lured him into Iraq, they kidnapped him, and they murdered him. Um, you know, it's, I would it hardly call it an execution. This is, this is basically a murder um, of a journalist. Um, and it's interesting, those defenders of the Iranian regime who were weak before would say, well, who would go and, and kill a scientist in, in relation to Fakhrizadeh in Iran? Whatever one's view is of that action, uh, let's not forget that the Iranian regime has killed hundreds like uh, Rol Azam in, in foreign soil and in European soil, it has it has restarted this habit. In the book, actually, I go, I explain how, you know, there was sort of a division of labor in the early 90s where for the Quds Force and Soleimani would go on and do uh, managed relationship with, uh, with Hezbollah um, and with sort of the allied forces with Iran and the intelligence ministry would do the assassinations abroad. And they had stopped doing that after, uh, after a, a court in Germany um, really took seriously some of the assassinations, but they're back. Um, I think what it shows is that the IRGC and serious part of the Iran establishment are, um, you know, they've been they've been actually going on a spree recently against Biden, right? Um, in some ways, they're actually I would say they they actually let me let me just give you one example. I just want to be fair, and I don't want to sort of. You know, the managing director of a Basij Alain newspaper recently protested President Rouhani. What did he protest him for? He said, how dare you say Trump, but Mr. Biden? Why don't you use the term Mr. Trump, um, but you use the term Mr. Biden? And what would you disrespect President Trump? Now, it might be surprising to some viewers that an IRGC editor is um, talking about respecting President Trump, but they basically are very hardline about saying, um, saying no to Biden and killing Zam is a um, is a sign to say basically we don't want to change right we want to be this nasty regime that we are and and I think if this 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 I consider to be qu quite important that the hardliners in Iran are not and were not pro the Iran deal up to 2015 and will do all that they can to prevent diplomacy with the United States because their economic and political interests are threatened by diplomacy with Iran so this, I mean, I think this is an important uh, takeaway. I have no illusion about the Iranian regime, of course, as I've tried to explain, um, but it, it is ironic that those who oppose any diplomacy with Iran um, in, in the United States sometimes seem to repeat uh, the desires of the hardliners in Iran. 
It's a, a very interesting point and, and one that we don't think about it. Another question focuses a little more on the, the internals with the IRGC. Uh, do you see a internal bureaucratic battle with the IRGC that they're on the back foot with some of these recent failures and is that impacting some of their behaviors and planning as well? Um, the IRGC is not a united organization. Um, and by this, I mean more than having serious sort of necessarily ideological disagreements. It's a, it's a, it's a big empire that is not is very well managed. Um, it is, it, it's an economic behemoth, right? It controls something like 30, 40% of the Iranian economy. Um, now, when I, I'm, I'm actually having some pieces soon published on the, the uh, for example, a startup market in Iran and how, how the IRGC has infiltrated it. I was shocked by how um, many different sectors of the IRGC act like very serious economic actors, basically. They want to get rich, you know, like, like any other sort of economic actor. And um, their utilization of their holding on to the Iranian state um, and all the sort of revolutionary verbiage is, um, is in this sense like, um, not prioritized, right? When they're when they're going after this economic interest, so I think after the assassination, assassination of Fakhrizade, which I mean, again, this happened. This is this is the key factor, really. One of the most highly guarded assets in Iran was assassinated. You know, not when he was traveling somewhere, not when he was in Tehran, but in a heavily guarded village of Assad. Uh, who anyone who's gone you know near there it's not somewhere you can just go in right it's a it's a highly guarded area so they know they have very serious security vulnerabilities um before that of course the entire nuclear archives of iran israelis you know stole it like you go to a blockbuster and rent a video i mean they they walked in they took everything out in two days so these are frankly embarrassing and inside the rgc now there is talk that oh you know maybe when you arrest every student and every visiting a scholar and artist as Israeli spies, the actual Israeli spies can actually get away. So I think there's a crisis of competence, basically, and there is economic competition. Um, and I think uh, in the future, like after the death of Khamenei, um, there, will be, uh, there would be splits inside the organization and talk about how to follow. And that, that everything that I said about the Iranian establishment, those who want to have better relations with the West, they want to be a normal country, that also exists inside the IRGC. Not in its current leadership, which is Vet to Khamenei, but it does exist in different parts of its ranks. So taking this image of the IRGC, you described their economic impact, the, uh, the dynamics between the hardliners and the reformers. How would you, if you had the chance to you know brief president-elect biden right now how would you say to what would your advice be to approach iran and uh you know how to approach this debate of a hard line or reapproaching the uh the nuclear deal or attaching human rights uh things how would you uh, if you had that chance advise the president-elect um well i think first of all the first admission in this debate, and there is, you know, there's going to be a lot of debate, is that President Biden is going to have a very hard task. It is, you know, this is going to, this is going to be a very hard fight. There's, and those who pretend there's an easy answer, really, anyone who pretends there's a very easy answer to this is, is, is lying, frankly. Um, because, of course, the Iranian establishment has played this game for a long time now, right? And it's it has the experience of the nuclear deal of 2015. Um, uh, it has the experience of dealing with four years of Trump. Think about this. The, the maximum pressure policy of President Trump um, had many effects. It's severely weakened uh, the Iranian regime in some ways. A, um, by severely weakened, I mean, it hit its economy, right? And frankly, it, um, it made life worse for millions of Iranians. But they, if you're in the IRGC and you're Khamenei, you think, well, if we survive this, we can survive anything, frankly, right? Like it's impossible to imagine, uh, short of military attacks, uh, you know, any policy that 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 would be that would bring more pressure. Um, so I think, so here's here's what I think, um, uh, you know, President Biden can do. Um, there is now a window. On, 
in June, Iran is going to have presidential elections. Um, the candidates in the elections, like every other election, are passed by Khamenei, and you know we know sort of the basics of that. Um, but if the political mood changes, if there is a serious, if there's a serious chance for some sort of a reconciliation with the U.S. in the mood of 2015, I think it can affect the results of that election, which for long had been, you know, everyone thought the NRGC figure would come in and get it. Um, but the calculations that Iran Hello, I'm so sorry. I think I got cut off. So, oh, no problem, Doctor. Z. You're, you're, uh, yeah, there we go. You have to rotate. There we go. I'm sorry. I, um, no, we're glad we were able to to reconnect, but we we lost you part way through there. Okay, so I'll um, so I'll, I'll continue on the question. Um, so you know, I think uh, I think I said I said my piece about it being a very difficult decision and the fact that the Iranian regime has uh, has survived. Um, so I think. Ultimately, we have presidential elections in June, and I think what happens in the next six months can be very important. And the calculations of the Iranian establishment will fundamentally change um, if, if basically Biden, Biden administration does something in the next six months in outreach uh, to Iran. Now, I think uh, I think I speak for most Iranian progressives. Um, uh, you know. And most of those who actually favor human rights in Iran and who are, of course, uh, opponents of the regime, and I don't hide that I am as well, um, we, I think a policy that would be most detrimental to the hardliners in Iran and in the best interests um, uh, of the Iranian people, but I think also in the best interest of the relations of between the two of our nations, Iranian and Americans who have had a long interest, is a diplomatic approach. And I started by saying it won't be easy. Um, so I don't pretend it would be easy, but what a diplomatic approach would look like. Um, I think some sort of a return to the Iran deal because Iran is saying now there, Iran is, President Rouhani says, we are ready to go back with a snap of a finger, basically. He couldn't have said it more clearly. He said it a couple of times in opposition to the Iranian hardliners. Um, and of course, using that as baseline for further negotiations and for and for dealing with Iran, for entering Iran. But but economic dealings with Iran um, should not be done under illusions. The IRGC gangs that I talked about control much of the Iranian economy, um, and it could actually be disastrous if if economic dealing just ends up empowering them, frankly, and um, you know just keep basically make, making them gaining more money for them, but it doesn't need to be like that. And I think ultimately it's a very difficult uh, situation, but I think ultimately more negotiations with Iran, more engagement with Iran is actually most lethal um, to, to, the, to the Islamic regime. And on the human rights issues, um, I think um, both through European allies the United States has um, and itself, it can push on a specific um, on a specific um, issues. Now, Iranians talk all the, you know, all the nonsense about, oh, the judiciary is independent. Of course, it's hardly a judiciary, uh, hardly enough for it to be independent. And I think um, this is a broader, it's not just about Iran, right? Uh, it's very unfortunate that human rights often doesn't have a role in diplomacy. But if a, you know, if American diplomats, European diplomats really said, you know, before the next round of negotiations, you know, we need to see the release of these human rights prisoners, they'd be surprised. Um, like any other game of diplomacy, it's, it won't be, you know, it's not like they say it and it happens, right? But if, if the United States wants to make it a priority to stop some of the most barbaric actions of the Iranian regime, they will do so because they, they favor their own power um, and, and sort of broader national security interest more, um, you know, so much that they'll, they'll stop some of the most barbaric acts if they know they're, they're impeding those. Well, th thank you for that. That's an excellent uh, overview, even with the digital hiccup, but we, we appreciate that. And it, it's great advice. And uh, hopefully either live or uh, watching uh, some people who are making these decisions will uh, will be hearing this. I'm going to turn perhaps, you know, no less complicated, but perhaps a little easier to look back at history. And we have some questions here about your scholarship on Soleimani. Uh, and his life and, and um, some lessons from that. And perhaps some of them can be applied to these current challenges as well. Uh, but one question talks uh, just about his origins that he came, you mentioned his tribal origins, that he came from a tribal area. How does that, uh, is there more to expand on that? Has it affected his 
uh, his career and the ways he's memorialized now? Uh, yes, certainly. I think it. I think it affected him in 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 a couple of ways, and I think it also says something about some parts of the sort of Iranian regime. Um, I think it it affected him because he was an outsider. He really came from, uh, you know, s- tribes of southern Kerman. Um, uh, you know, my mother family is also from the same province, but from the sort of provincial center. Um, so I, uh, you know, even even to Kermanis, he would be an outsider, let alone to the rest of Iran. So he was really sort of a humble man from a, from a humble sort of tribal background, unlike you know, most Iranians. Most Iranians today live in cities, right? Um, and then um, when the regime was being built up, most of the leadership was from the big cities like Tehran, Mashhad, Esfahan. Um, so I think it affected him as an, as an outsider. Um, it also meant that he understood tribal dynamics and used them very skillfully, frankly, throughout his career, whether he was when he was fighting in the drug wars in the eastern borderlands of Iran with Afghanistan and Pakistan, and he really showed his first penchant for democracy, uh, sorry, for diplomacy. Um, and later on in Iraq, later on in Lebanon and in other places, Soleimani was, after all, able to work with forces with many different politics. For example, he was, you know, um, the Kurdish Socialist Democratic Party is a small party, but in general, left-wing parties in Kurdistan who were secular, who were you know, not, not Islamist, Soleimani was able to work with them. I think it's because he had that tribal background and, and uh, he, knew something about, um, he knew something about how to understand tribal relations. But it's also a story of how the Iranian regime was often built by, this, by some of these people who were outsiders, who had been marginalized before, and who were impoverished in the 1980s, um, especially throughout the war with Iraq. Um, but I would say that this empowerment was not an egalitarian. The Iranian regime does have an impressive track record in rural development, I have to say, which is why if you look at the UN reports, it got a lot of praise for the work that it did in the 1980s. Um, b- books like Kevin Harris as a social revolution g- give a good uh, overview of the Iranian welfare policies. But at the end of the day, what happened was rise of uh, new elites, basically more dispersed around Iran, more provincial elites who became, uh, you know, uh, basically they run the Iranian regime in those areas and the marginalization um, of, of the people in those areas in general continues, especially if they're from non-Shia areas like Sunni areas of of Baluchistan and, and Kurdistan. So I think it's a story of how the marginalized, uh, people from the marginalized areas found import in the Iranian regime and found positions of power, but that didn't necessarily translate into, um, uh, you know, into empowerment for the, for the general population. In looking back at his life and his impact, what are some of the most uh, important or impactful moments in his life that you think we can draw lessons from going forward? Um, that's a, that's a fascinating question. Um, so I think, so everyone talks about the experience of war with Iraq. I think the experience of war with Iraq was where the Iranian regime was born in 1979, right? And it went to a war a year later, like 1980 for eight years. It was here that it really built his, uh, foot soldiers, right? People who believed in this, um, this Islamist vision, um, who believed they were, it has a few elements to this, right? They believed that they had fought a war um, against all the world and for, with some justification, you know, it is now in the book, I detail how some countries did help Iran in the war, including the state of Israel, which sent, uh, uh, which, which sent weaponry to Iran and blazed them with the Star of David. Uh, and the Iranians used it in the war with Iraq, which is sort of forgotten often. And the people's government of China gave a lot of help to Iran, Assad, Syria. But they often thought that they're fighting alone against the world, and they, you know, to some justification, because all the uh, all the great powers were certainly not on Iranian side. Um, they were not always squarely on the Iraqi side either. But the Soviet Union was more pro-Iraqi, and the United States, uh, while it was not more pro-Iraqi necessarily, it did help Iraq at time. So it that sort of that built their that vision uh, in the Iran-Iraq war, um, and of course they were defending their country, so that. You know that, like any other country, the fight against the invader really built up the regime in those years. Um, I think the other key moment is two thousand and one, which I talked about also before, where they were collaborating closely with the United States after um, this collaboration en- ends by the government of George W. Bush, and um, it follows by the invasion of Iraq, which really leads to a 
existential fear for the regime really and it's upon it's upon that that it builds um you know it builds its policies and the last points i would say is the arab revolution of 2011 i think this is a moment that is important because um when soleimani went up and said that iran is on the side of the oppressed and will support this movement and all that i think at, at some point he knew he was lying that and i think this is very important right Imagine if you are a young Islamist who truly believes in these ideals. Um, you know, then you look at the actual Iranian policy, you're like, well, wait, if you're supporting Islamists against, you know, against the powers that be, how come in Syria of your backing a secularist uh, president, you know, against all sorts of forces that are more Islamically inspired, as they already did in the early 1980s when they supported Assad's father against Muslim Brotherhood in Syria in a massacre of, uh, of Hama. Uh, when uh, thousands of people died in the 80s. So those illusions were gone by then. So I think um, the descent of um, Islamism into this sectarian, sectarianist bloodbaths of the last 10 years and shrewd power interests um, uh, are very, uh, you know, very important milestones uh, in, in Soleimani's life. Of course, uh, I can't also not mention the 2006 war of Lebanon and, and, and Israel, sorry, Hezbollah and Israel which uh, which I have a chapter in the book about. I think it's called Busy in Beirut. So um, because, you know, Soleimani sent a message to David Petros famously um, in Iraq and said, sorry, uh, I've been busy in Beirut if you haven't heard of me in Iraq. So um, I think that was, you know, a point of pride for Soleimani because he was able, um, Hezbollah was able to um, confront Israel, let's just say, and not get totally destroyed as it had feared at the beginning. And Soleimani showed a lot of, courage and sort of personal presence on the on the battlefronts there that I think uh, that I think was an important uh, milestone in his life. Uh, the, the cheeky messages aside, the Soleimani, you know, built that mythos, uh, you know, how much did that, uh, that myth surpass his skill? Was that a fair assessment? And then how do you see that too in, uh, in who succeeds him with Ismail uh, Ghani? And others, how you know, is the Quds force weakened by his loss, or are there others to to fill his shoes? Um, the question of the question of how you know how the myth versus reality is interesting. But let me just say something that is important, and that do you know who played a very important role in building this myth up? The the American media, frankly. Now, um, this is just a. I'm not even saying they should not have done that necessarily, but you know, the sort of personality driven US journalism, um, right, really had an important role here. And you'd be surprised when you when you look at all the media in Iran, um, in their commemoration of Soleimani, the first thing they say, you know, they very rarely first show the pictures of Soleimani say in the Arab world, they love the Newsweek cover, which is probably more republished than like anything I've seen for years. Um, and then there was news we cover, and of course, it was a New Yorker's uh, sort of cover story. And the fact that Soleimani was getting this kind of recognition really meant a lot for them. And he definitely played into it. He came out of the shadows. And you can say maybe he paid for that with his life. But I mean, if you want to be a shadow commander, you can't have a Twitter account and social media account where you take carefully collaborated, uh, collated images and post them. Um, but he definitely was very skillful in ways that Ismail Khani can can never be, frankly. First of all, he was a he was a commander. He had experience of war with Iraq. Um, now I'm not a military historian to say how successful he was in, in the war with Iraq, but I think he was a you know he wasn't you know he was one of the commanders. It, it's not like he had this you know earth shattering abilities. So he, he certainly wasn't known as them. If you read the media, IRGC media at the time. He's considered one of the top commanders, but in no way is that remarkable. But I think one, he really showed uh, remarkability in his years as the Quds Force commander since 1998 to the end of his life in 2020, was that he's the guy who is very much in, in, in there in person, right? Um, if you have this job, right, it's very important to be able to move between Beirut and Damascus and Baghdad in the, in the measure of a day. And he did that. And time and time again, he would go in the middle of, uh, of a crisis. Now, I don't believe some of his uh, comrades told me that he was in Gaza in several points. I basically don't believe that. I think I think they're making that up. But uh, but he definitely went to Lebanon at, twice at the height of the war with Israel, and that really took a lot. And by twice, I mean he had to leave 
he would, he would come to the Syrian border, he would meet with Ahmad Mughni, the leader of Hezbollah, who was later killed by Israel. And they would go inside. And um, so it was very much on the scene. He did this one also in Tuz Khurmatu, the Shia Turkaman village in Iraq, which was surrounded by ISIS. Soleimani basically, um, you know, parachutes inside, right? He comes with a helicopter. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so he, you know, he had this kind of presence and was able to build this charismatic relationship with the soldiers. Qa'ani is just the last game from the beginning in this point because he doesn't have the same kind of charisma um, and his ex expertise has been on the Iranians' relation to the East, basically, Afghanistan and Pakistan. He doesn't speak Arabic, although I think he's learned quite a bit in the last year. Um, uh, but, but uh, what I would say at the end is that I think the commander of the host force is going to turn into a different position. Basically, they're going to realize, look, we can't remake Soleimani, so let's not try. And they make the command of the Quds Force into a more coordinating uh, position. Um, and Qa'ani, as someone who is from uh, Khorasan in the northeastern Iran, like Khamenei is, and like his most likely successor, Ibrahim Raisi is, he is very politically savvy, um, uh, Qa'ani. And, uh, um, you know, I think he's, he, he also has presided in this job over a very hard period when Iran has much less money to give Hezbollah and to give its Iraqi allies. And there's a backlash, as I said in the beginning, in both of these countries against the Iranian forces. So I think at the end, what you say is not the attempt to create another Soleimani, which they know is impossible, um, but to make Qani in a more boring, bureaucratic uh, sort of position, which he was effectively as deputy, first deputy to Soleimani for more than 10 years. Um, he was more of this boring, bureaucratic coordinator position. And I think that's what they're gonna uh, turn him into. But the question of what would that mean for that Shia transnational army that Soleimani was uh, was able to build uh, is interesting. I I think basically the days of that army uh, in that in that effective way are gone, and you you'll see a much uh, you know much more like the 80s, uh, a more um, a more uh, sort of de decentralized right um, coordination of Iranian help to these groups without them being um, in the sort of same united way that they were at the height of the war in Syria. Do you? Uh... Do you think he was gearing up for politics? Yeah, absolutely. So I have, I, as I reveal in the book on, on, on good sources, he, he considered running for the president in 2021. Um, I mean, think about it. It's a, it's a too big, big of a temptation. Uh, now, like in the United States, we know very well that, you know, everyone wants to be president, right? So anyone who can sort of puts a team. I mean, uh, so similar in Iran in this sense. Um, he was madly popular. Uh, look, look, by the way, when I say madly popular, um, relatively, okay, I, I, I do not believe that we, none of us has opinion polls in Iran, but I would say that within the figures of the Iranian regime, as a military hero, um, you know, he had, he had much more popularity um, than, say, someone like, you know, you know, some of the other pro-regime figures, like the lo lost ele electoral candidates like Ghalibov, Soleimani's friend Ghalibov, and um, Raisi, and the other ones. So, um, you know, and he had some bipartisan support within the sort of parties of the Iranian, the factions of the Iranian establishment. So he, he very seriously considered it. Um, it would have been a very interesting challenge to Khamenei had he, had he openly um, declared it, which, which also brings me to this other, um, one of the reasons to think that assassination is not a good plan um, is that killing, you know, top figures like this effectively helps um, regime unity at the top level in, in some ways, right? Um, he could have been a serious rival uh, to Khamenei at some points. Although, in answer to your previous question, and this it has definitely weakened uh, the host force, as I tried to explain. Um, you know, as we're, we're sort of in the, the final uh, 10 minutes here, and um, I do see we have... Um, uh, one hand raised here, so I will uh, turn to that one real quick. So, uh, Shaima, you're going to be able to speak here. Thank you, Dan. Hi, Arish, and thank you so much for this discussion. It's very nice. Um, well, I'm an Iraqi Canadian, so my question will be more about Iraq and Iran, especially after the revolution of October. Uh, there was like uh, a fight back from the people that we need our country back because we, everything that happened during 2003 till 2019 and 2020, it was horrible for the country. So what I'm saying, um, my question is, 
in Iran. I am so curious to know about the people there. I don't want, like, I know the government point of view, like, they want, especially in their own words, this crescent Shia uh, way, like uh, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, Yemen. So are the people really believing in that? Is there a lot of opposition for the government? Is there a chance that this regime will end and we'll start to be like, you know, we share like the whole Eastern border, we share it with Iran. We cannot stay like this forever. So is there like a motive from the people like they want to end this? I know it's not easy to be opposed to the regime there because you get executed, you'll be just like disappeared, just like in Iraq. Uh, that's one thing. And the sec second thing is that what's the replacement? Is Iran ready for like if this regime will go? What is the replacement? Is there anyone ready to take this role? And thank you. Thank you very much. May I respond now? Yes, please go ahead. Um, thank you very much, Shema, for speaking. And um, I should say, um, let me first I mean, let me first start by saying I you know I did talk about the uh, October movement in Iraq and I I did talk about Prime Minister Mustafa Kazemi I think the attempt of Iraqi people um, and I I, mean, I mentioned Kazemi as a person but I think the attempt of Iraqi people to establish a sovereign independent Iraq with equal relations uh, in the region is one that is not often talked about and should have the support of the United States it should have the support of of uh, people in the region it certainly i think has the support of the of the iranian people who who don't want their government to dominate iraq in the way that it has um and i think if you know all this talk about combating iran's influence in the region you know what's the best way ensure free elections in iraq in june give the uh, prime minister kazemi and those forces the economic leeway um basically give them the political space the economic space that they can use to establish, um, uh, you know, popularity for themselves, uh, pol political space for themselves, and be able to um, to ha have uh, equal relations with everyone. I think I think Iraq is in exciting ways, is in exciting times, and I think um, the fact that it now can have equal relations with with Saudi Arabia, um, with with Egypt, uh, Jordan, and, and and European countries, Denmark just reopened its embassy in Iraq. I think these are are very good news. And the days where uh, Washington and Tehran decided who the prime minister of Iraq would be, um, which has been the fact for the you know since two thousand three, um, will end and should end. And that's good news for Iraq, but also it's good news to Iran. Because, you know, as Karl Marx once said about Ireland and Britain, that, you know, the people of Britain can't be free until the subjugation of Ireland ends. I believe the same thing about Iran, that Iranians uh, can't be free um, until this uh, subjugation of other countries uh, by Iranian forces uh, ends. Um, as to the question of regime uh, future in Iran, look, it is, I speak as an Iranian uh, political writer, for fact, this myself. Um, uh, so what you know what I think is positive and I hope are sometimes into clash this regime is is very strong unfortunately uh, sorry the regime is not actually very strong um, but the chances of its sort of survival for the immediate future uh, are there I think um, I'll say two things I'll say first of all that unfortunately there is not a organized opposition to the Iranian regime that they even though there is mass sentiments against the regime in Iran. There is not an organized political alternative and that needs to change. I think that's the job of well, people like me and all the other Iranians to put our differences together and, and organize a democratic political opposition. Um, um, but I think that there is a basic incompatibility of the regime with the aspirations of the Iranian people. And that's not my sort of wishes. That is really my cold blooded analysis that this regime has basically failed. It has not created that Islam is public that it wanted. Um, which is why it faces serious opposition and mass opposition, which is why thousands of Iranians have died um, coming out in movement after movement after movement. 1999 they did, in 2009 they did, in 2017 they did. I don't know why is it that some analysts can only see the crowds um, when it's in Soleimani's funeral and they forget millions of these crowds who came out against this barbaric regime time and time again. It, it always baffles me um, uh, when they say, oh, look, there's a funeral. Some people came out. But you know, everyone can go to a funeral, but if you're able to risk your life and come out in, in demonstrations, maybe that's more telling of where your sentiments lie. Um, 
so um, I think there's a fundamental in- incapability and I think the hope of people like me um, to see a different regime um, for the future of Iran, which is tied to the hope of an Iran that has equal relations with Iraq, has equal relations with the United States, and even one day has relations with Israel as it once did uh, in the past. Uh, Iran that is a normal country that, that follows its the interest of, you know, of, of national security of its people and doesn't try to export its failed revolution to other countries. I think that hope is real. And I certainly believe I'll see it you know, in my own lifetime. So, uh, you know, and I'm not that young. So, so, hopefully, so hopefully this is something that, uh, that we'll see. Uh, one final question before we unfortunately have to wrap up. This could go on for much longer. It's fascinating. Uh, as we get to the New Year's, for us policymakers, a New Year's resolution to get rid of one misconception about Iran, what would you like it to be? Um, I'm sorry, I got I got. Sorry, I got. I got silent for a second. Um, I think the misconception that Iran is one thing. That I think acceptance of that duality that I started with, i.e., it's a country and it's a regime, and that it's a, it's a regime that is not united. I think that's very that's very important. It's a mis and the part of this misconception is that the misconception that you either have to be um, anti diplomacy or you have to be favoring the regime. Of course, some people who favor the regime, um, you know, will will speak in favor of diplomacy. But I think in, you you should be able to do both. And in fact, it needs to be the goal of you to be both. Look, we have four years of President Trump's maximum pressure policy. Did it help democratize Iran, or it helped it more isolated? Um, it helped it, you know. It is not. It's not coincidental again that the Iranian hardliners effectively support such a policy. They oppose the Iran deal. They oppose the Iran talks. They literally hated Obama's government and um, and 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 President Biden. Now um, it's because their interest is tied to that. So I think we. So I think we should remember that the it should be the goal of diplomacy um, to help promote equal relations with Iran in the understanding that that can actually lead um, down the road um, uh, to to the weakening of the hardline hardliners in Iran and uh, and not the other way around. So I hope this this duality, the hard duality with Iran, and uh, can be kept in mind. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. It was an honor to be. Thanks for being with us today. And, and, and I hope people will take a look at the shadow commander Soleimani, the US and Iran's global ambitions. Um, we appreciate you, Arash Azizi. Thank you, there you go. Joining us from uh, NYU in New York. Thank you for taking the effort to, to write the book and enlighten us. And to all of those participants today, thank you for joining us and everybody uh, happy holidays, stay safe and, and be well. Thank you very much, thank you.